First of all, there's, you know, everyone has to realize that the success behind AI, if you think looking like chat GPT, right? It was, there was tons of tons of money more invested into training those such models that we don't have, you know, we don't have such money in research at the university level. Follow your passion. You know, whatever you love, life is too short to do what you don't like. So make sure IIT, uh, we had very good coursework. So some of the best courses that I've taken that I still refer back to after all those years. Is, I think that to overcome that issue, you need to have a good mentor that kicks you off in the right direction. You generate thousands of simulations and you train an AI model for a specific problem. You're not going to be just solving that problem for the rest of your life. You know, you're living in a dynamic world. New problems always come. New applications come. New challenges and issues come. That Hello students. Today we have a very special guest with us whose work is mainly focused on computational biomechanics. Or in short form you can call this as CBM. So what is computational biomechanics or CBM is? If you don't know. It's like kind of rooted in computational mechanics and it's a crucial field for understanding and uh, improving the mechanical aspects of biological systems. Let me give you a few examples first. As you all know that many people these days are suffering from osteoporosis problem, right? Athletes worldwide and maybe your parents are also in that list are suffering with these issues and sometimes people used to visit doctors to opt for hip and knee replacements. So what are the role of CBM researcher is? They simulate how this uh, implant interacts with patients' bones and tissues in order to ensure the replacement should be a proper fit and function properly. Since each patient has unique requirement, right? So this approach becomes very essential. Let me give you another example, which is also very important. Cardiovascular disease analysis. You know that CBM is employed to study the biomechanics of blood vessels and their role in cardiovascular diseases. It aids in comprehending factors like uh, blood pressure, vessel wall stress, and the analysis of the cavitic nature of blood. We all know that blood flow is uh, turbulent, but it is also cavitic in nature. Okay, So CBM models the formation, helping researchers to understand the mechanics behind blood clot formation, which can lead to conditions such as stroke. And this aids in the development of prevention and treatments. Now currently there are widespread researches are being conducted in these directions uh, and with, with also varieties of applications. Now as we all know that AI is booming in this era. So when integrated with AI, you can't imagine that entire process becomes even more fascinating and time effective. Since we are all aware about this fact that uh, AI can analyze and process large data sets in a very short amount of time. So in this case also, the processing over the biomechanical and psychological data, AI extract the valuable information and insights that may not be apparent through traditional methods. AI algorithms can optimize biomechanical models, making them more accurate and efficient, which ultimately lead to better simulations and predictions. So we have our guest, Professor Dr. Amir Hussain Arzani, whose research is mainly on this field and he is going to shed more light on this. Who knows, you might be interested in doing research in this field or if you are already a researcher, you may thinking of collaboration with him or with his group. Therefore, I hope this session will be very helpful for you. So, without any further delay, let us begin our today's session. So thanks, Professor Amir, for joining us and accepting the invitation. So uh, we have uh, lots of discussions awaiting for us. So starting with, uh, can you uh, explain, I mean, can you share with us your academic journey? I see that you have uh, completed your BS from Isfahan University of Technology. And then from there, you came to US 
pursuit for higher studies. So if you could briefly share your academic journey with us. Sure. Yeah. So I started my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2006, straight out of high school. I got my bachelor's degree in 2010. At the end of my bachelor's degree, I started working on cardiovascular CFD as my bachelor's thesis. And that's how I got uh, connected with my advisor, Sean Shadden, who was at IIT in Chicago at the time. So in 2010, I moved to IIT, started my master's there, and then right after that, PhD. So my advisor actually moved from IIT to Chicago. So I started my PhD at IIT. And after one year, he moved to uh, to Berkeley from Chicago. So I also moved with him. So I uh, got my PhD from UC Berkeley in 2016. And all degrees are in mechanical engineering. Uh, and my uh, area of research was on uh, cardiovascular CFD modeling and also dynamical systems, transport uh, in the context of cardiovascular disease. So did you apply for any fellowship? I mean, how you came from Iran to U.S.? That's a good question. So I know there's not really, we don't have any fellowship that sponsors Iranians from Iran to study abroad, uh, at least definitely not in the U.S. And then, so the main source of funding that students get is either RA or TA funding. So now at master's level, it's pretty difficult to get funding in general, especially these days. Even at the time, it was pretty difficult. I remember most master's students coming to IIT at the time, they were self-funded or many of them were self-funded. But I was lucky to get a TA, uh, so my advisor, uh, he, he uh, was able to secure a TA position for me. So I was fully funded by a TA funding. And then after a year, it was switched to an RA funding. So I, uh, and, but, but the reason for that was because I wanted to do a PhD after a master's. So I kind of had talked to my advisor that, hey, I don't want to just do a master's. I want to do a PhD, but I do need a master's degree because I do want to get a master's degree in between. So I'm going to first get the master's, then get my PhD. And that's kind of the way that I was able to convince him that that was my plan. So he kind of saw it as a longer term investment. So that's how I was able to get the uh, funding at the master's level for TA and then after that, RA. So starting from your master's only, you were motivated that you are going for a PhD student. You will not look for any industry job yeah. or any you were... You were focused yes, on that's right. that's right. That's right. I wanted to become a faculty, actually. From day one, I knew I wanted to become a faculty. So that was my plan. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. So uh, so it's. I think it's a very wonderful experience for you that you have uh, studied both in IIT Chicago and then you, then you went to pursue your PhD at UC Berkeley, which is also a very reputed institution. So what are the differences you have noted in the work environment in both this institute? That's a very good question. So my advisor was the same. So the culture of the work environment was not much different because it was the same research group, same advisor. The culture of a group is mainly dictated by the advisor. So that wasn't much different. But in terms of the environment beyond the group, the research group, at IIT, uh, we had very good coursework. So some of the best courses that I've taken that I still refer back to after all those years is the courses I took at IIT. Very, very rigorous courses. We had, as an example, at IIT, all graduate students were required to take two uh, advanced engineering analysis, so two advanced mathematics courses. All mechanical engineering students had to take two of them. At Berkeley, there was no such requirement even for one. In Utah, we don't even have such a course in mechanical engineering department. So that was really, really fantastic. That really builds the, build the foundation of mathematics for all students the kind of mathematical topics that are necessary for many students doing computational or theoretical research uh, in all areas of mechanical engineering. So that was fantastic. So in general, we had great instructors and great coursework at IIT. At Berkeley, we also had very smart faculty. I guess the main advantage that I saw at Berkeley was that in, in our lab, I was surrounded by many, many smart, you know, smart students. So you, know, you always want to be in a place that you're surrounded by people who are smarter than you. And that was fantastic at Berkeley because you know, all my lab mates, they were all fantastic students. You know, whenever I had, I was thinking about a problem, I would go consult with them and they had great solutions, even better solutions than my advisor would have. So that was fantastic because it really helped with my research productivity, getting feedback from my peers and uh, you know, solving problems, you know, talking with each other, discussing things. That was the best advantage that I personally got from Berkeley as opposed to 
uh, IIT. But other than that, I think IIT was also a fantastic uh, place. Uh, so you can go and talk to anybody and I mean, even if uh, he is not your, he is not in your group, you can still talk and get some. Uh... Yes, you can. But that, that's right. You can still. Do that. But the thing about your group is that you're all sitting next to each other. You're constantly talking. So these are people who are sitting right next to you. Their computer is right next to you. So you're spending hours of time with them and something doesn't work. It's like, hey, do you have any idea how this can work? And they say, yeah, you can do that. And. There you go. Your problem is solved, so, right? Just like that. So that's fantastic. That's that's I think that was the part that I really enjoyed when I was at Berkeley, uh, uh, being surrounded by very smart uh, students. Uh, and you know, it's a two way thing, and they get your feedback, you get their feedback. So it's that was that, that's the part that I enjoyed the most. Okay, thanks, Professor Amir, for having for giving such an insightful discussions about your academic journey. So uh, let us now delve you into your research uh, expertise in fields of. I see you have a, you have a diverse research in different field in computational fluid dynamics, in computational biomechanics, and you have also worked in physics in from neural network. So could you provide insights into your work uh, and uh, and also its uh, significance in the era of uh, deep learning? Sure. Uh, so I, my research started as a graduate student on cardiovascular patient-specific modeling of blood flow to study cardiovascular disease using CFD. So we take MRI, CT scans from patients, build 3D computer models, run CFD simulations to study blood flow and fluid mechanics of blood flow and provide additional insight behind a disease progression or disease initiation and treatment. So that was the work I did as a graduate student and specifically the what we focused on was chaotic advection and chaotic transport because blood flow is it's transient, it's chaotic. It's not really fully turbulent, but it's chaotic and complex. So we use a lot of concepts from dynamical systems theory, like the up and off exponents, uh, uh, manifolds, Lagrangian coherent structures to better understand the complex chaotic patterns of blood flow in uh, disease uh, vasculature. So a lot of focus on flow physics, uh, vortex structures, flow separation, those kind of things. So that was my PhD work. And um, then um, as a faculty, I started building interest in, uh, so we continued that work. So we're still working on that kind of more traditional work, but also I um, became interested in uh, machine learning. And we've been also working on different projects related to machine learning. So we're working on so different fronts related to that. So one topic we're working on is a sparse data-driven modeling, building data-driven reduce order models, and also so using that for understanding the flow, but also using that to improve the quality of data. If you have like corrupt data, data that's not perfect, how can we use these tools to improve the quality of data? We're also using physics in from neural networks, as you mentioned, for uh, hybrid physics-based and data-driven modeling. So if you have data, but the data is not perfect, and then we have governing equations, but they're not perfect either. Let's say we're missing a boundary condition. Then can we merge the two to get the best of both worlds? That's what we're using PIN for. And then finally, the most recent topic we're interested in working on is the topic of interpretable and explainable AI. So we're working on building some new tools for interpreting deep learning. Because deep learning is a black box, or that's what they say. So we're trying to use, uh, develop new methods to better understand how deep learning makes its predictions and specifically in the context of physics-based modeling like fluid mechanics uh, so that's the most recent topic we're working on so i just have one question as you mentioned that in your phd you have worked on bi computational biomechanics blood blood related problem so do, did you have tie up with some medical institute Yes, so we collaborated with uh, Stanford on our project. So the School of Medicine is at Stanford. So all of our data, the MRI data that we had came from Stanford. So these were data that was already collected and we used those data for our studies. So yes, yeah, so we had partnership with uh, uh, medical uh, collaborators. Okay, thank you for sharing the insights of your research. So uh, I see that you have also worked on finite element yeah. method. What are the relevance of traditional approximation approaches like FEM in this age where AI is booming these days? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So that's one thing that I always criticize some people about thinking that AI can replace everything. So uh, 
first of all, there's, you know, everyone has to realize that the success behind AI, if you think looking like chat GPT, right? It was, there was tons of tons of money more invested into training those such models that we don't have, you know, we don't have such money in research at the university level. And also it was trained on the entire internet, right? It's like, we don't have generating such large comprehensive data sets for us, the computational mechanics folks. It's, it's really, really difficult, if not impossible, at least now uh, with our current computational power. Uh, so I think, you know, find element is still very much relevant. It's still, it will continue to be relevant. And um, the best example I can give you is that let's say, you know, you can somehow afford to train an AI model on a specific problem. Let's say somehow you can spend like months to generate large data sets. You have the fastest supercomputer in the world. You generate thousands of simulations and you train an AI model for a specific problem. You're not going to be just solving that problem for the rest of your life. You know, you're living in a dynamic world. New problems always come. New applications come. New challenges and issues come that new problems come in industry, whether that's climate or whatever it is that we need to be prepared for and solve those problems. So now, are you going to be able to use that AI model on that? Probably not. So what are you going to do? You're going to again have to generate, if you want to use AI, again, you have to generate the large data sets. How do you do that? That comes from simulations because most of the time. So, you know, find element will continue to be relevant. Um, I think it will be even more relevant uh, than before because now we also need to think about how can we make uh, such traditional models more efficient so we can produce large data sets. Uh, that maybe previously we didn't think about this, but now we also have to think about how can we efficiently generate large and large data sets that these AI models need using a find element model. Um, so I think find element is students should think about AI as just an additional tool, just like previously they learned computational mathematics, they learned the theory of find element, they learned find difference. Now they can also learn machine learning. So there's lots of opportunities in AI. So I think it's a very exciting time right now to be a student because you're at a new age of a completely new way of doing things. You know, you can think about quantum computing be the next big thing that could come sometime later, the, the next big wave. But I think find element is still pretty much relevant. Students be trained, should be trained. Those, if you want to be a computational mechanics expert, not just CFD, broadly any topic related to computational mechanics, you, I mean, you should know computational, traditional computational mechanics, whether that's find element, spectral methods, whatever is more relevant to your problem or whatever you're trained in. And also, you know, think about AI as an additional tool. So I think, um, again, I think, uh, but it doesn't mean that you should also ignore AI. I think AI has a potential to solve many problems. You can think about AI broadly in uh, two different ways. One way that most people tend to think about machine learning when they first learn about it is that machine learning is going to be a quick way to solve a, a problem. So it's going to replace my element. Instead of taking a day to run a problem, it's going to take a few seconds and I'm going to get my answer. Right. That is one way to think about it. Of course, and that's the part that you need large, large resources to build something that's meaningful that could be applied in different domains. Now, the second way you can use machine learning, which is, in my opinion, at least more, more interesting, is that you can use machine learning not to replace finite element, but to augment finite element and experimental data or solve problems that are very difficult to solve using traditional methods. So imagine you have a CFD problem where you're missing boundary conditions or some parameters, and you also have some data which is very sparse and low quality. How can you combine the two to get very good quality data? There are traditional approaches in data assimilation that allow you to do that. So there are techniques that we used to solve these problems in the past, but they're really very difficult to implement usually. With machine learning, it's much easier to solve these problems now. It's very easy to code these problems and solve these problems with recent machine learning tools and software. So I think there are more, you can, more problems to be solved with machine learning rather than just replacing find element. And you know, you can use find element to generate data and have it fit it to a neural network. But as I said, you have to always realize that deep learning, which is your best bet on fitting complex data, 
it doesn't extrapolate. It's perfect in interpolating. I mean, when I say perfect, if you train it well. So all the things you learn in your machine learning course or the machine learning tutorials in the textbooks is how to build the machine learning model that's good in interpolation. They never tell you about how it can extrapolate because it's very, very difficult. And that's one topic we're working on right now is extrapolation. But you know, you can't extrapolate much. Even if you can improve extrapolation, it's going to be a little bit. So you have to realize that your machine learning model is only as good as the parameter space that your FEM data covers. Now, the question is this. If you already solved the, all the problem within the parameter space, why do you need AI? Why not just solve it? You already solved it. Why do you need AI if AI can only interpolate? So that's another thing that you have to carefully think about these questions before you just blindly apply AI to a large finite element data set and say, hey, I have this new model. So what? Why are you going to use it? Are you going to, you know, how are you going to use it that you just couldn't use one of those FPM simulations? So like, just to give you some examples of that, you could use it for optimization, you could use it for uncertainty quantification, in digital twins where you need real-time prediction. So those are some like, examples, but you have to really consider the context and those examples before you just blindly generate some data and fit a machine learning model. So I have one additional question that uh, as lots of researchers still not focusing on AI, maybe there are lots of research projects and funding are, are available solely on AI. So research on FEM is becoming quite less. I mean, not only FEM, this type of traditional methods. So do you think that uh, this type of traditional methods will be obsolete after a certain period of time? Because there are no funding for that. That's an excellent question. That's a question that was brought up in one of the federal funding agencies recently. Uh, so that's true. There is more funding to AI and with limited funding from federal agencies, it unfortunately does mean less money to pure traditional approaches. So that's, that is a concern of many uh, people who are working in this space and doing traditional mechanics research. So, uh, but again, at the end of the day, you know, we do need to advance AI because there's lots of potential for it. Every day we're seeing new exciting applications. But again, I think that those traditional approaches, we still need to do research on them, especially how effectively to integrate them with these more modern uh, uh, machine learning tools. So I think uh, my advice to everyone who wants to work in this area is that if you want to learn machine learning, uh, first of all, learning from a fundamental perspective. Don't just learn to apply the, the, um, the, the libraries. And you know, at first you might, and the, the common, the misconception that I had when I first learned about machine learning back in 2015, about the hype of machine learning. This is 2015 is when Google, I think, released uh, uh, TensorFlow. So this is when deep learning really started to become big in the academic setting. Uh, and that's when I first heard about it. And everyone was talking about it's a black box. It's a magical algorithm that fits data, right? And it wasn't interesting to me at the time. But when I went and started learning it more deeply, learned the mathematics behind it, I realized that it's, you know, it's, there's a rigorous, there's a lot of linear algebra, rigorous optimization. There's lots of hardcore mathematics behind deep learning. It's not just magic, right? I mean, there is some magic to it, to be honest, but but not all of it. Most of it is not magic. It's, there's rigorous mathematics. So try to learn those things and think about how you can contribute to advancing the algorithm behind AI and really understanding how it's working to be able to make more meaningful contributions uh, in this area. So, um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be a researcher, but... Uh, uh, and a lot of opportunities for students. But again, I think fine element modeling is still pretty much relevant. Okay, so let us now discuss that. Uh, what are the vacancies and collaboration possibilities with your research group? Sure. Uh, so uh, at the very moment, I do not have a PhD position. I already have six in my lab right now. But, you know, this is very dynamic. Things always change. So if you're watching this video, you know, a few months later, you know, Please do contact me for a position. Uh, but at the moment, I don't have a position. Uh, but then for collaborations, you know, we're always open to collaborations. If you have some idea where you have some expertise that, you know, that, you know, that can add to what we have and you can use what we have that can add to what you have, you know, that's a perfect example of a collaboration. So, you know, we always, we collaborate with many different universities and many different groups. So that's, you know, the most, one of the most exciting things about research is collaboration. 
it often happens that uh, phds often fill this type of problem that uh, i mean after a certain period of time they suddenly observe that they are uh, they are doing a problem which is not so significant or the, their problem has already been published by by someone else so it's a very hard challenges phds often face so what do you think uh, i mean what do, what would be your suggestions for them i think the most important factor that can help with that is having a good mentor your advisor is a, is responsible for defining a project and making sure that it's something meaningful and something that's relevant and something that's novel so at the beginning of your phd journey you know your advisor tells you what to do because you know you're not experienced you you do what your advisor says but you know as time goes by maybe during the second half of your phd during the first half you work very hard you stay on top of the literature and you learn the literature you become an expert yourself and the second half of your phd i always tell my students the first half i tell you what to do the second half i want you to tell me what we should do right and then you tell your advisor what we should do once you're an expert and you on top of the literature and you know what's going on in the field so i think that to overcome that issue you need to have a good mentor that kicks you off in the right direction and in a relevant problem that's that's relevant to your skill sets and you know and to make sure that you know if you're working in this in ai space it's very competitive because everyone is working on that now so, so like you could do something you want to submit it and you're realized hey someone published that paper 3 weeks ago 3 weeks before i submitted it, submit the paper so my advice for that is that use google scholar google scholar is your best friend google scholar is amazing so what do you do use it in two different ways one know the big people in your area subscribe to them on google scholar google will send you an email a day after the paper is published so you'll know it right away number 2 subscribe for keywords so google scholar allows you to create some keywords uh that again once every two days usually it emails you whenever a new paper with those specific keywords that you uh define are published that's the easiest way to make sure you're, you're on top of you remain on top of the literature right because um uh, especially if you're working in an area that you know many other people are working i think it's absolutely necessary that You know, your advisor might be on the top of the literature now but maybe he's not two months later and one month later the paper that you're working on someone else does it so it's that's my advice uh, for phd students to make to use google scholar to stay on top of the what's going on in, the, in real time because you know, it sends you an update once every two days usually okay thanks professor for having such a nice discussions So uh, I think it would be very helpful for our viewers as well. So we are on the verge of the ending of our session today. So I just have one final question, which I which I usually ask to all of my viewers: that what are the piece of important advice would you like to share with with our viewers? Sure. Uh, so I think follow your passion. You know, whatever you love, life is too short to do what you don't like. So make sure if you want to be in academia, if you want to do research, select a topic that you really like. if you are you looking for phd positions i know probably many students are looking for phd positions if you're a masters or undergrad student you know looking to pay a lot of attention to the lab to the lab and advisor that you're choosing you know usually students are confused they just look at the rankings of the institutions and they make a decision based on that but the 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 quality of the, the life and the future trajectory that you're going to have is going to be largely determined by the lab that you're working You could have the best four or five years of your life doing a PhD, or you could have the worst four or five years of your life doing a PhD, and that's not based on if you're at MIT or at other university. It's it's largely determined based on what lab you're working on, who's your advisor, and what's the culture in that lab. So so try and the best way to learn that is to talk to students students in the lab before you join the lab to kind of under learn the culture in the lab. So I think that's. one piece of advice i have for students is uh, to uh, and always use mentors you know mentors are very important so make you know uh, find mentors that uh, that you can use their experience to make sure you're you know navigating your future career in the best way possible so thank you we we really have a very wonderful discussions today so i wish you all the best for your future endeavors and have a nice day thank you i thank you